I think the point at which I really wanted to write this book was, was probably the beginning of 1992, in fact, when my wife and I had our honeymoon in an incredibly chilly Vienna and Prague. And this was shortly after the end of the Cold War. And having grown up with the sense of Eastern Europe, of this incredibly grey, threatening zone, it was incredibly moving being in Prague and seeing Prague re-emerging as a central European city. Um, and I suppose off and on ever since then, I've always wanted to talk about the, and help this process of disposing of this horrible Eastern Europe and getting back to Central Europe, this idea that the Habsburg areas of the world, Hungary and the Czech Republic and Austria, um, these were all places which were central to Europe's experience. And we're used, we, we've become used to seeing them as being cut off in some way. And my book, I think, is like one of many contributions to, like, to moving the whole of that area back into our consciousness uh, and seeing what an exciting place somewhere like Transylvania is, you know, how wonderful places like Slovakia and Moravia, southern Poland, the, you know, the Carpathians. You, know, you can just, anyone can just get a cheap flight now and go to the Carpathians. It's brilliant. You know, when I was growing up, the Carpathians seemed infinitely remote and just somewhere where there were like Warsaw packed tank maneuvers, you know, but suddenly this is, you know, you can go there it's, and it's the most beautiful part of Europe. Um, when I finished writing Germania, I felt really awkward about uh, that book because it's a sort of trick um, it's a history set in the modern state of Germany, uh, which has no bearing really on the much wider boundaries of Central Europe, which used to exist. And Germany was ruled really outside Germany, outside modern Germany, from Vienna by the, the Habsburg emperors, who were the Holy Roman emperors as well. And uh, the, so I sort of, with that book, I managed to persuade the reader that there was a coherent story there when actually it was a kind of a fib. And so Danube, now Danubia is kind of putting something back in the community by admitting that actually the whole story of Germania has to be seen as part of the story of Danubia, i.e. the rest of Central Europe. Um, so it's a huge, it's a huge area, um, which now I hope between the two books will make some kind of sense to some readers. It's quite hard to think about like favourite areas or, I guess I would just like it all to be honest, I mean, it's a bit pathetic as an answer, but. I mean, I think I really found the whole place completely fascinating. I think it's less, I, there are some areas where it's fair to say that they've had such a grim time in the 20th century that it's hard to be wholly enthusiastic about them. You know, I loved Western Ukraine, which used to be the far eastern border of the Habsburg Empire. And, um, but it's really, uh, towns like Lviv really have had such a grim time that it, it's quite hard to say from a tourist point of view, oh, you should go there, though it is an incredibly beautiful city, but it's also a very mournful place. Um, and that's probably true of many of these cities. Um, um, I suppose I love, obviously, like everyone, Prague and Vienna and Budapest. You know, these are the big poles around which the book is set. Um, but there's also so many of these like smaller towns uh, which are very little known in the West, places like Debrecen or Chesky Krumlov or Brashov uh, or Trieste, which are just the most wonderful places packed with their Habsburg past uh, and a sort of, uh, sort of jewel-like places you know, filled with fascinating buildings, art, food, people, you know, it's, it's a... There's tons to explore, and I hope the point of the book in many ways is to try and persuade people to look further afield. I think it's fair to say the Habsburg family is the single most important family in Europe's history. Um, they were in charge of large parts of Europe from the Middle Ages until the end of the First World War. And even though some of them were really total idiots, I mean, they're not the most impressive bunch of people. You know, some of them were wonderful patrons, some of them were clever war leaders, but most of them, you know, they couldn't believe their luck that they just have to inherit this job. And yet, despite their kind of occasional idiocy, they, uh, they hung on, whereas all these predators around them, they were always having to fight off people who wanted to take over their empire. Um, they somehow managed to outlive them all. There's like, you know, endless families, you know, uh, had the highest hopes of defeating them and they all wound up being destroyed. 
And so there was clearly some kind of at least animal cunning in the Habsburgs, um, which without which you know, Europe's history simply doesn't make sense. They're involved in everything. Roughly the area of the Habsburg Empire um, in its kind of like 19th century form was it's, you have northern Italy, uh, you have the Tyrol, you have Austria, you have uh, Bohe the Czech Republic, so Bohemia and Moravia, Slovakia, sort of uh, southern Poland, Hungary, uh, Croatia, uh, Slavonia, which is like part of Croatia now, uh, and Transylvania, which is now part of uh, Romania. And Transylvania, I have to say, is just one of my absolute favourite parts of the world. Everyone should head there. It's just incredibly beautiful. It's like a, it's a very screwed up mixture of like the South Downs and Dorset uh, with very few people. It's a wonderful place and lots of wonderful castles. And so this is the sort of area. But then in addition, the Habsburgs also at various points, and I talk about this a little, owned everything from, from Holland and Belgium uh, down to these territories along here, along the edge of France, Spain, Portugal, um, other bits of Italy at different points, um, uh, intermittently areas over here, because where they're always fighting the Turks along here. Um, and uh, the Spanish branch of the family, who I talk about briefly, uh, of course, also inherited you know, the whole of the Americas, the Philippines, um, an absurd, vast empire, which um, affected the Central European Habsburgs as well, because there was this great pouring in of cassowaries and toucans and chocolate and coffee and all these things coming in the ships through here and into Central Europe. Um, so that's the rough area that the book's about. The book starts in uh, the darkest, gloomiest bits of the European forest, trying to recreate a sense of how um, grim Central Europe was in sort of like the, you know, the, the Roman, post-Roman kind of period. And it goes all the way up to the First World War, which is obviously kind of slightly comically um, over-ambitious. And I have to skate over all kinds of things. Um, but I try and sort of focus on just a few things which seem interesting, rather than having a kind of endless narrative. Um, so I miss out all kinds of things, which I'm sure will annoy people. And I've spent much too much time on other things, just because I think they're fun, which also annoy people. Um, but the idea is to just create a sense of enthusiasm for these extraordinary events and try and show how they're sort of, how they've shaped our world in ways which uh, we might have forgotten. You know, that most countries' borders really are the result of the Habsburgs uh, and their kind of successes and failures. Uh, and, you know, people are living in specific political spaces today in some cases, a result of some overwhelming cock-up, say, 400 years ago. You know, like these, the, 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 there's, I want to create a sense of people having t to today being surrounded by the debris of decisions by very peculiar people wearing wigs uh, many years ago, um, and the degree to which that history still keeps biting us in ways which we're surprised by.